The Nicolas Cage character in the 2005 movie Lord of War was inspired by a real man, the infamous international arms smuggler Victor Boot, who ran a vast weapons empire until a sting operation led by U.S. agents took him down in 2008. <laughs> This man is Victor Boot. He's best known for supplying weapons for civil wars in Rwanda, Congo, Liberia, and all of this earned him the nickname, the Merchant of Death. There are over 550 million firearms in worldwide circulation. That's one firearm for every 12 people on the planet. The only question is, How do we arm the other 11? Victor's story begins in the capital of Tajikistan. His mother was a bookkeeper, and his father was an auto mechanic. When he was around 20 years old, he was living during the Russian Revolution. The change from communism to capitalism was hard for all of Russia. Many people were stealing and making money illegally. But he was a businessman, and he knew that there was a lot more money to be made legally than illegally. And he understood the most important rule in business. Want money? Solve a problem. The first idea that popped into Victor's entrepreneurial mind was to start an import company, to bring in goods from the former socialist countries, to import beer and other products like Coca-Cola, sweets, and sausage, which were never available in Russia. After about eight months, the company started doing really well. They started earning a pretty good sum of money at the end of each month and him and his wife were able to upgrade their lifestyle. In Moscow, most of the business was dirty business, but Victor believed that he was smart enough to be able to make money anywhere in the world. He realized that in Russia, there was only a certain amount of money that he could make. He needed to scale up. So what did he do? He started a new business that he operated in Brussels. He leased Soviet cargo planes and sold them for three times their value. In 1993, I start new firm with old friend Sasha Kipkala. We established small company in Brussels, one secretary and two guys in that office. Саш, что тебя послушать вообще? Как куда ни приехал, должна быть отметка. Сделал был был Санч. Да. His first client was the Angolan government in Africa. Two years, 100 flight hours each month, 1,200 bucks an hour. Needless to say, that was a very lucrative deal for Boot. He was making a lot of money, however, nothing lasts forever. His time in Belgium did not last long, and the company started falling apart. So he decided to move to the Emirates. He was buying, packing, and shipping 24 hours a day. It was the big bang of globalization. His cargo company shipped 200 tons of cargo every day. He was shipping cargo that came from producing countries and was sent to all the Soviet republics and other smaller countries. Most of the cargo was made up of consumer goods like textiles and, funny enough, boom boxes. Meanwhile, in Angola, there was an imminent second civil war, and this is when things really started blowing up. His company started by providing the Angolan government with logistics support. All the roads in Angola were heavily damaged or non-existent, so all transport could only happen by air. Victor saw the business opportunity right away and took advantage of it. Africa was sort of a happy hunting ground. There was so much to be done. The food for all the supermarkets, 
There were lots and lots of reasons for the planes to be out there. Soon enough, he started moving cargo and selling his services to all Africa. The fact that Victor's company transported weapons was never a secret. All of the employees knew about it. I always think of business as flowing river. You need to have more than a thousand projects under consideration. Maybe one of them productive and makes money. At this point, the company was bigger than ever. By 25, Victor Boot was a millionaire. By 30, he had built an empire. He had business all over the world. Projects in Mauritania, diamond concessions in the Central African Republic, businesses in Europe. In three months, his company had taken over the cargo market. He had officially become the modern-day monopolist of logistics. You smell that? What is that? What? What's that smell? A cologne? No. Opportunity. No, money. Oh, okay. I smell money. Okay. And even though the world hadn't noticed yet, weapons trafficking. It was at the end of 1998 that the noise began. It was first tied to some publications and UN reports. I think that the first time Victor Boot was on my radar was in the late 90s. And it was just seeing this name cropping up again and again. Victor Boot is indeed the chief sanctions buster at the present time, a real merchant of death. Первый раз, когда я услышал Викторе как о торговце смертью, чувствовал, что, по-моему, у английского министра не все в порядке. But Victor didn't feel guilty for anything. He saw himself as a legitimate businessman. He had no responsibility for what he was shipping. They can manufacture a jurisdiction like they did. They can manufacture nexuses. They can manufacture all other legal stuff, but they can't manufacture a truth. Truth is there, and regardless of their opinion, the truth is very simple and square. I'm innocent. I don't commit any crime. There is no crime to sit and talk. If you're going to apply the same you know, standards to me, then you're going to you know, jail all those arms dealers in America who are selling their arms and ending up killing Americans. They are involved even more than me. By now, Victor Boot was one of the world's most notorious weapons suppliers. But Boot was about to acquire another client, one that would get him noticed by the West, especially the United States. In Afghanistan, around the 1980s, there was a brutal civil war between the Mujahideen and the Soviet Union. Victor Boot already had a deal with the Afghan government with arms, and was about to close a second deal. But the Taliban were rising to power, and they wanted Boot. It was in Afghanistan that things took a wrong turn. On August 3rd, 1995, I get a phone call. One of my planes transporting 30 tons of ammunition was intercepted by Taliban forces. The Taliban forced Victor Boot's aircraft to land. They took the crew hostage and took more than half of the ammunition for themselves. Boot had to fly to Afghanistan in order to get them to release the hostages. He met with the Taliban leader, Mullah Omar, and he wanted to become a client. It was the start of a lucrative partnership. Boot had made around $50 million from the deals with the Taliban. At the time, the Taliban weren't under anybody's radar, but suddenly, everything changed. On September the 20th, 2001, the US launched its war on terror. Within a month of the terrorist attacks on the Twin Towers, the United States invaded Afghanistan. The Taliban weren't enough. They wanted Boot. They couldn't catch him yet because Victor Boot had retreated to Russia, where Putin had replaced Yeltsin. He was safe there. Meanwhile, the US government was more determined than ever to bring the Merchant of Death to justice. A terrifying image was created around Victor Boot as the media dug their claws in. Boot's involvement with arms dealing was the inspiration for the film Lord of War, starring Nicolas Cage. Victor Boot was ready to sell $20 million worth of weapons. They call him the Merchant of Death. America's only bargaining chip in the dispute over Edward Snowden. One of the most dangerous men on the face of the earth. Victor started enjoying the limelight, and that's when authorities started taking him really seriously. 
He went back to Russia and started exploring new businesses. Him and his wife nearly went broke, to the point that they had to borrow $3,000 from friends every month. The federal operation against him was called Operation Relentless. They used a man who had managed his company for some time and who was now playing a double game, Andrew Smulian. We tried to find an individual that could lead us to Victor Boot that had operated with Boot in the past, and that penetration point to us was uh, Andrew Smulian. He was an older gentleman that had managed one of Boot's companies in South Africa and he was not always a very successful guy in his endeavors, was down on his luck, and we believed that Andrew would be a willing partner in this scenario. One day, he met in Bangkok with Andrew Smulian. He went to Thailand, still knowing the dangers of the trip. Against everyone's advice, he went there and was arrested. The confidential sources had two recorders on them to ensure that if one failed, that we would still have one good recorder. He is now serving 25 years in jail. He was put in downtown Manhattan in solitary confinement. He was accused of conspiracy to kill American officials, intent to acquire surface-to-air missiles, and the sheltering of terrorists. Hey guys, thanks for sticking till the end. We hope you enjoyed the video. We'll keep making these mini documentaries every week as long as you smash the like and subscribe buttons. Also, leave your thoughts in the comments and let us know if you have any particular video you'd like to see.